service here this evening at the Tron Church. We're going to sing in a moment, but let me just read first some words from Psalm 107. The psalmist says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Well, we're gathered this evening from east and west and north and south, and downstairs is a lot more from the east, and we're gathered here to praise the name of our God, whose love endures forever. So we're going to sing these words from Psalm 107, number 107 in our blue books, give thanks to God, for he is good, his love will never end.
as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we do indeed give thanks to you, our God of grace and mercy, whose love endures forever. And how glad we are as your redeemed people to say so and to sing so. As we sing the words of this psalm together, Lord, our own hearts echo the truth that is spoken by the psalmist. We find ourselves singing, yes, this is true, all of this, all of the ways, so many ways in which you have proved your faithfulness to your people. Sometimes your people wayward and deaf to your call, turning their faces away, thinking they know their own way is better, and yet discovering the folly of their ways and the chiding and even the punishment at your hand, and yet a chiding that always is to bring us back, to bring us again to sanity and to safety in your way and in heeding once again your word. Other times, Lord, when your people have been faithful, and it's been because of that faithfulness that hardship has come and struggle has come and battles have come. And yet again, even in the darkest night, even in the deepest place, your wondrous works have been shown to your people. And we know, Lord, in our own lives so often that we can echo the truth of all of these sentiments because you are a good and a gracious God whose steadfastness in love endures unmoved, unchanged, and unchanging despite our fickleness and our often changing path and changing sensitivity to hear your words. We are we're so quick to go our own way, so quick to feel that especially when times are good and things seem to be going well, to trust in our own understanding. And yet so quickly, our own wisdom is proved to be folly. Our own way is shown to be one of foolishness and often disaster. But for your unchanging love and your deep, deep mercy that follows us and guards us and has held us in, repeatedly, constantly. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are the one who pours scorn and contempt on those who walk in the pride of their own ways. But to your own people, even when they're diminished, brought low through oppression, through evil, and also through times of great sorrow which stalk all of us in this dark world, you again and again have proved yourself faithful. You've raised up the needy out of affliction. You've made their families like great flocks to help them and nourish them and care for them and remind them of your great love. And so with the psalmist, we echo these words, whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. And so as we gather tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your own Son, beloved, only begotten, who came into this dark world to prove forever the full extent of your steadfast love for us. While we were yet sinners, he came for us. While we were yet enemies, he came to make us friends through his own infinite sacrifice on the cross. So we consider the steadfast love of the Lord our God made known above all fully and finally in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we rejoice and we're glad and we sing praise to you and we rejoice that you are our God and we are your people. So, Lord, remind us of these things tonight. Make us wise. 
as we attend to these things. If any of us here tonight is, is walking waywardly, thinking that they know better than you, would you remind them, Lord, that none knows better than you? And if there's someone here tonight who, who knows that they have thought that and it's taken them far away and it's got them into such a mess, let them consider your steadfastness in love and your promise of mercy to those who return, who repent, who bow the knee again to you. And so all of us tonight, Lord, however we come, make us wise to consider your steadfast love so we might also be found to be your steadfast people. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. A very warm welcome to you uh, this evening, especially if you're visiting with us. Uh, if you're here for the first time, I hope you'll feel very much at home among us as a fellowship of God's people. Uh, after the formal part of the service, there's refreshments served upstairs here and also downstairs in the, uh, in the foyer, in the entranceway. Uh, don't rush away unless you have to. Uh, there's ample opportunity to meet and greet one another. And uh, why don't we just make that uh, something that we do at the end of the service uh, for the first few minutes. Look around, uh, greet somebody you don't know, and uh, if it's your first time here, uh, speak to somebody and they'll be glad to speak to you. And uh, we can encourage one another in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be studying this evening in uh, the book of Jonah. Andy Ritson is uh, our preacher. He's beginning a short series. Uh, and we look forward to that. In a moment, we'll be reading the scriptures together. But before we do that, we're going to sing once again number 568 in our blue books that uh, reminds us that we are the church of God, elect and glorious, that we're a holy nation and chosen as God's own special people with all the responsibilities that that brings and the great privileges also that are ours. So we sing together number 568, Church of God, Elect and Glorious.
Well, we're going to turn now to uh, our Bibles for our reading, and we're going to read in uh, the prophet Jonah from Jonah uh, chapter 1. That is on page 774, if you have one of our Blue Church Visitors Bibles. Uh, if you don't have one of those, well, you'll have to find it. It's one of those tricky ones in the Minor Prophets near the end of the Old Testament, uh, after Obadiah and before Micah, just uh, hiding there to embarrass you as you try and find it and find it very difficult. So I'll give you a moment. Jonah chapter 1, and we're going to read uh, the whole chapter, which does go right to verse 17, which is, for some strange reason, uh, chopped off at the end under a separate heading, most unhelpfully. So obviously somebody was feeling a bit off when they were putting the headings in the Bible. Jonah chapter 1 at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, capital of uh, the Assyrian Empire, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. And then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us and we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What's your country? Of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quieten down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quieten down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they couldn't, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us the innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Amen. May God bless to us his word. Well, we sing again, number 697. A hymn that in the third verse calls out, Lord, I believe, now help my unbelieving. I come in faith because your promise stands, your word of pardon and of peace receiving. All that I am, I place within your hands. Perhaps Jonah could have been singing this 
in the middle of his deep sea adventure. Who knows? Number 697. <laughs> going to take up our offerings uh, now for the Lord's work here and uh, all across the world. As we do that, as the musicians play quietly, you might like to uh, take the opportunity perhaps to read through the rest of this little book of Jonah just to uh, familiarize uh, yourself with it as we'll be studying it tonight and in the next few weeks. Uh, but as we do that in the quiet, our offerings for the Lord's work uh, will be received.
Let's pray. Strong in thy strength and safe in thy keeping, tender. How we thank you, Lord, that you are the God who made the earth, the sky, the sea, everything in it. That all this world, all the affairs of this world, that our own lives and all our own affairs, all that is in front of us, all is in your hands. And so we have great confidence and in your mercy and in your kindness. Your word to us gives us also great clarity about your purposes for our lives, the way that we are to walk, the path that you would have us tread, the thoughts that are to fill our minds and our hearts, the deeds that are to make up our lives. And so, Lord, as we come to your word now, we pray that you would open your word to our hearts and open our hearts to your word, that we would be eager, ready recipients, not resisting your Holy Spirit, but opening our eyes and our ears to him through these words that he has caused to be written. You would also speak to us now your living word for our lives this day and this week. Help us to hear that we might go and do to the glory of Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen. As Andy comes then to preach to us, we sing together the prayer in the words on the screens. Now in reverence and awe, we gather round your word in wonder we draw near.
good evening. It'd be great if you could have Jonah chapter 1 open in front of you as we go through. Now, I'm sure most of us here tonight will be familiar with the book of Jonah in some shape or form. And I imagine that our overriding memory of studying the book of Jonah was probably in Sunday school. There we learnt not to grow up to be big racists and share the good news of Jesus with everybody indiscriminately. Now, that is a good lesson to learn from the book of Jonah and an appropriate application. But I think the book of Jonah is far more cutting than that. And if we're to make the most out of this mini-series, I think we need to be asking ourselves constantly, Why was this letter actually written, this book? What was it that Jonah wanted the people of Israel to learn from this letter back in his day? What did he hope that his words would achieve in the hearts of the people? And why on earth did he write such a damning account of himself for such a wide and general readership? Well, I'm convinced that Jonah wrote this book after he had learned the lessons that he needed to learn. And he wrote this book because he wanted Israel to learn the same lessons that he had learned. So Jonah wrote them his story, that they might see the ugliness of his behavior and see that exact same behavior exhibited in themselves. Jonah's account of his trip to Nineveh is his way of painting an honest portrait both of himself and of the nation of Israel. Joan hopes that by letting Israel see what she looks like, warts and all, through his story, that Israel will be repulsed and finally change her ways. Another way to think of it is to think of Jonah as being like a mini Israel. Everything we see in Jonah's behavior and attitude and heart reflects the heart of the people of Israel. So then how does this book then relate to us? Well, once we've made the link between Jonah and Israel, we can finally make the jump to us and put the spotlight on us and be examined ourselves. But we're not supposed to stand back from this book and judge Jonah, nor are we to glance down our noses at him or the people of Israel. No, rather we're supposed to to recognize our propensity to be just like him and recognize that we need to learn the exact same lessons that both Jonah learned and the people of Israel needed to learn too. And I think as we go along, we'll find that those lessons are quite revealing of our own hearts and very searching. Lessons about our terrible apathy, despite our great privilege, Lessons about our hypocrisy and inconsistency, but also, thankfully, lessons about our wonderfully gracious and merciful God who we are called to imitate. So let's delve right into chapter one and remember to put ourselves under the examination as we spend some time scrutinizing Jonah. Our first point for this evening is that you shouldn't pick and choose. Our walk with God cannot resemble that of a child walking through a pick and mix shop. We can't just choose the things that we like and ignore anything that we dislike. And this is the kind of behavior that we see in Jonah. The whole of this first chapter, I think, um, focuses around verse 9. All centers around verse 9. Verse 9, Jonah claims that he fears the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. But as a reader, I think we're left scratching our heads a bit because all we know of Jonah so far is that God has called him to a task and rather than obeying God and going to Nineveh, he's defiantly set sail in the opposite direction. I mean, we don't really know where Tarshish is. Some commentators say it's in Spain. Some people say India. But what's important is what it says at the end of verse 3, where we get the theological explanation. Jonah was fleeing away from the presence of the Lord. He wanted nothing to do with God, nor his plans to pronounce judgment on Nineveh. 
So can we really say that Jonah fears the Lord? And when the sailors are calling out in anguish, chucking boxes and cargo over the side of the ship, crying out to any pagan god who will listen to them, when God has hurled a storm against them, Jonah is just laying down in the bottom of the ship, fast asleep. The sailors were fearful of this God who had sent the storm, though they didn't know him by name yet. But Jonah just didn't seem to care at all, does he? He's fast asleep in blissful apathy. So does Jonah really fear the Lord? And when he is finally exposed, when the sailors cast lots and the blame is clearly pinned on him, how does he respond? Well, he urges the sailors to chuck him overboard, and that might sound very noble, but I hardly think this was completely an altruistic act. He hasn't shown much concern for the sailors' lives up until this point, or anyone else other than himself. He wanted absolutely nothing to do with God and his plan. And when we get to chapter 4, we'll see that Jonah was so angry with what God had called him to do, that he says he would rather die than participate in the work that God would have him do. So does Jonah really fear the Lord? As the reader, I think we're left reeling at Jonah's hypocrisy. How can he say that he fears the Lord? He talks the talk, but does he walk the walk? And we're left wondering how Jonah could be quite so petulant and inconsistent. Well, I think in order to unlock Jonah's psyche, we need to have a quick look at his ministry that he had back in Israel before he was called to preach judgment upon Nineveh. And we read about this in 2 Kings chapter 14. Let me just read it for you. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned for 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. That is, the king in Jonah's day hadn't taken down the golden calves that he'd commanded the people to go worship instead of worshiping in the temple. But nonetheless, Jeroboam restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel was very bitter, for there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. So on the surface, I think it looks like Jonah had a pretty successful ministry in Israel and quite a comfortable time compared with most of the other prophets that we read about who generally got quite a raw deal. I mean, Isaiah had to just preach at the people until they they would never repent. He was at the center of a very positive looking project as Israel reclaimed land that was once lost to them, which was prophesied all through Jonah. This was something that hadn't happened since the time of Solomon. Israel had never taken any serious land back. It booked the trend of the general decline of Israel. So Jonah had a comfortable, successful ministry, and he was really at the heart of things in Israel's success. Now put yourself in Jonah's shoes for a second. Wouldn't you be a bit miffed about having to leave this kind of work in order to preach judgment on a barbaric nation who were infamous in the ancient world for their monstrous acts? It certainly isn't right how Jonah acts here in chapter 1. But I think both the people of Israel and us today can certainly find some area of contact with him, some area where we can empathize with him. Israel, like Jonah, were in a very privileged position being God's people and seeing unprecedented success with the borders expanding despite their lack of spirituality, genuine spirituality. Idolatry still went on in Israel, but they saw success. 
They were happy to soak up the privileges of being God's people and give lip service to God, but refuse to obey him. When scrutinized under the microscope, Israel were exactly like Jonah, talking the talk, making big confessions, but not walking the walk, picking and choosing when it was good for them. And I don't think we're too dissimilar, are we not, if we're honest with ourselves? We pick and choose when we'll obey God, do we not? We make confessions about our God with our lips, but we don't always back it up with our actions, if we're honest. We enjoy being God's privileged people, enjoying sitting under his word every Sunday, fellowshipping with one another and having a true and certain hope of the new creation. But do we as a church or individually have any no-go areas? Is there something that we simply could not give up if God called us to it? Now, I think we have given up a lot as a church. In the words of Hebrews, as a church, I think we can say we have joyfully accepted the plundering of our property since we knew that we had a better possession and an abiding one. I think that we have made great sacrifices for the gospel over the last few years, and that is wonderful and to be praised. But we need to be sh- ensure that we keep on doing that. And I think you admit that even though we do well in some areas, I know in of myself there are some parts of me that I personally struggle with. And I'm sure that you're the same. I mean, I'm much more f- secure and at home befriending people in church who are just like me. And I find it rather difficult to talk to people who aren't like me, and as a result, I find slightly awkward. And my word, I would have kittens if Willie asked me to start a ministry like Tron at Two, or start a new street ministry. I'd find it utterly challenging and completely uncomfortable. And no, mini- no, Willie, that is not an invitation for you to help me to grow in godliness and faith. <laughs> But we do need to be open to serving in whatever capacity is needed for the sake of God's kingdom and not just when it suits us. If we're going to follow Jesus, then he has to get our hearts, our lives, and our all. And we can't throw a tantrum if more is demanded of us than we would naturally want to give. Sometimes I think it's helpful to think about how our friends and our colleagues outside of the church might perceive us. Do they see a people here, a community, who use their privilege in order to bless others, who sacrifice their comfort for the sake of God's continuing work in the world? Or do they see a discrepancy in what we confess and how we live? That's a question for us to ask of ourselves collectively as a church, of ourselves individually as well. Well, our second point this evening is, don't pick a fight you cannot win. That was some sound advice that my granddad gave me when I was a little boy, and as a result, I've never been in a fight. (laughs) Because there was never a fight I thought I could possibly win. But Jonah would have benefited greatly from this advice, as would Israel, and I think we would um, do well to listen to this advice to you today. As the reader, we're left in absolute disbelief, are we not, at Jonah's actions, all the way through this chapter. You can't help thinking from the very off that this is not going to bode well for Jonah. From verse 3 onwards, Jonah sets himself against the God who he claims in verse 9 is the one who made the sea and the dry land. And yet this foolish man decides to run from the God of the sea by way of the sea. And even the pagan sailors pick up on the stupidity of this in verse 10. Up until this point, Jonah had informed the sailors that he was fleeing from his God. But I don't think the sailors had any concept of the sheer omnipotence and sovereignty of Jonah's God until he discloses the reach of God's power in verse 9. Jonah's king 
Jonah's God is king over absolutely everything, heaven, land, and sea. He is not some little God who just has dominion over a small piece of land or sea like the gods of the sailors. Jonah's God is utterly different, much bigger, and sovereignly rules from heaven, having absolute control over everything. And when the sailors hear this in verse 9, they're gobsmacked. Why would you disobey a God like that? Why would you run away from him? And God shows that he is not a God to fight against, I think, in three ways through this passage. The storm, the lots, the casting of lots, and the fish. Firstly, we see just a fraction of God's power and sovereignty in verse 4 as he hurls up a storm in judgment over Jonah terrifying and vast but as effortless for God as just making a splash in a bath God is not going to let Jonah off the hook God is going to have his way with Jonah no matter what he will bring the ship to the point of sinking if it means bringing about his plans for the world and conforming Jonah more into his image secondly God ensures that the blame is fixed securely on Jonah. The sailors cast lots to work out who's at fault for the terror that they find themselves in. And the lot, sure enough, lands on Jonah. Now, we might be tempted to say, well, isn't that good? It landed on Jonah, not one of the sailors. Or they might have been thrown overboard. But we need to remember Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. The lot is cast in the lap but his every decision is from the Lord. God is even in control of the smallest of things, like what side a dice lands on, as well as the grand scale things like whipping up storms at sea. And to finish it off, God shows his absolute supremacy by swallowing either a pseudo-suicidal Jonah or one who just doesn't learn his lessons very quickly up by a big fish and spitting him out on dry land, showing that he is not a God to be messed with. And the vomit stains, I'm sure, would have been a lasting reminder of that for Jonah. But God didn't do all this out of delight and malevolence. No, God disciplined Jonah very severely, but he did so out of love, like a parent disciplines his child. God was committed to Jonah and wanted him to grow more and more into his likeness and to have a part to play in his great redemptive story. And little did Israel know, but God would do the exact same thing with them. Israel was just a featherweight matched up against the super heavyweight of the cosmos. Israel would soon be humbled and brought to a point of usefulness again if they liked it or not. And the most terrifying of disciplines was on the horizon for Israel. For in just 20 to 30 years, Assyria, whose capital was Nineveh, was going to roll in and flatten Israel. There'd be next to nothing left. God would inflict the most grievous of wounds to bring about faithfulness in his people and bring about his rescue plan. So this story was a stark warning to the people of Israel to stop playing games with their God. Like Jonah, they were not going to get away with their antics. They had provoked the king of the universe to fight and there was no way they were going to win. Now, I think I must caveat this point at this moment. Not every difficulty we face in this life is a judgment on God because of our disobedience. But we should be aware that God can and certainly does work this way at times. And I think this is a stark warning for us when we're playing games with God, not offering him our full obedience. He is not a God to be trifled with. And he will send wind and storm and break us to the point of sinking to bring us to a point of obedience to conform us into his likeness and get us on board with his plan. Our God wounds in order to heal. 
But surely, surely we'd rather avoid the wounding altogether if we can, would we not? And is it not an attractive thing to be conformed into the image of this God? A God who in chapter 4 is described as being completely other-centered, great and powerful, yes, but also abounding in, in steadfast love and kindness and mercy and grace. So my advice would be to you tonight, if you are caught up in some long-standing sin that you have managed to convince yourself that God is not all that interested in is, and is just happy for you to continue on as you are, think again. Because whether you know it or not, you're provoking the mighty warrior of heaven to battle. And he will bring an end to your rebellion one way or another. And surely it is wiser to repent today and vow to live rightly today rather than suffer the punches of a God who will knock you down in order to build you back up. Well, a final point for this evening is this. You must learn godliness from the pagans. That's right, you heard me right. Now, I'm not advocating copying everything the world around us does. But here in Jonah chapter 1, we are encouraged to imitate the sailors and not Jonah. Because all through this passage, Jonah creates a contrast between himself and the sailors. And to be honest, he's just utterly shown up by them, isn't he? There are three major contrasts made between the sailors and Jonah. The first contrast we've looked at briefly already, and that comes with their response to the storm. Jonah was asleep in the boat in an absolute apathy, whereas the sailors recognized that the storm was a supernatural judgment and recognized that they needed to do something in order to avoid God's judgment. Secondly, and linked with this, the sailors respond appropriately to what has been revealed to them. Not only do they recognize that the storm is a judgment, but when they hear Jonah's confession in verse 9, they inquire immediately as to what they must do in order for God to relent. Verse 11. They act rightly despite knowing very little about Jonah's God and offer sacrifices and vows immediately to the God they have just come to know as soon as they can. Whereas Jonah, who had far greater access to God's self-revelation and yet was very slow to obey and was utterly apathetic to God's judgment and discipline. Thirdly, even when Jonah tells them of the solution to chuck him overboard in verse 12, the sailors show real concern for Jonah's life and concern not to displease God. They would rather try and row back to land rather than murder someone in verse 13. And when they do finally come to the point where they have to admit defeat and have to throw Jonah over, they pray beforehand, don't they? showing real reverence of the God of Israel. Whereas Jonah only begins to pray in chapter 2. And even then, it's a pretty short-sighted prayer, as we'll look at next week, skimming over his personal failures and painting himself in a rather favorable light. So in the sailors, we see, I think, a people with very limited revelation of God, but nonetheless... People who are eager to make things right with God and show real reverence for him and urgency in worshipping him. And this is summed up in the last, in near the end of the chapter in the words, they feared the Lord exceedingly. This is what it means to fear the Lord, what the sailors do. Not just empty words like Jonah in verse 9. Well, what's this all got to do with Israel? Well, they, like Jonah, had lessons to learn from these pagan sailors. They needed to act appropriately in light of what had been revealed to them by God. And they had to be quick to act, eager to make things right with the God they had picked a fight with and worship him rightly once more. For that is what it means to fear the Lord, 
not just making pious sayings and going about things the way you want to. And for Israel, that would have meant tearing down these golden calves that they had set up on the high hills that they worshipped and putting away all of their false gods like the Baals and recommencing true heartfelt worship of Yahweh, whole life worship, not just words of the God of heaven, land and sea, who abounds in steadfast love and mercy. But history tells us that Israel did not learn this lesson in time, despite Jonah writing them this um, account of his voyage to Nineveh. But will we? Will we be eager to put things right with God when we know we have wronged him? Will we be a church who act consistently with what God has revealed to us? Will we be quick to repent or will we just carry on in our sin that we refuse to give up presuming that God doesn't really care about it and judgment really isn't coming no discipline is going to come my way God has very little time for hypocritical faith and empty confessions but all the time in the world for a response like, from, like that of the sailors well to conclude if you are anything like me, you'll find it very easy to identify with Jonah. I think we're, we've made the error of making Jonah into a kind of comical figure, a caricature, but we bear his resemblance more than we would like to admit. We all love success and comfort and flinch at the mention of sacrifice and cost. And none of our lives are fully consistent, are they? There is always some measure of discrepancy between what we confess and how we live. So let's spend some time praying for God's help as we strive to be a church who doesn't pick and choose when to obey. And let's not pick a fight with a God who controls everything and will surely win in the end. But rather, let's learn from these sailors. Be quick to repent and truly revere the God who has revealed himself so kindly to us and get on board with his endeavors in this world. Let me pray for us. Father God, we confess that we are not as we ought to be. We confess that there is far more darkness in us than we'd like to admit. We admit that what people see of us on a Sunday is far from the reality of the depths of our hearts. Our confessions are far more grand than what we live up to in reality. But we thank you, God, that you are kind and merciful and that you are a God who is committed to changing us and conforming us into your image and getting us on board on your redemptive plan which is a real privilege to be a part of so father we pray that you would challenge us convict us help us to repent of the sin um, that we are so long standing in our life that we struggle um, to do away with that we might not have to face the punches of a God who will knock us down in order to build us back up into his likeness. And Lord, help us not to be like Jonah, enjoying our privilege and wanting nothing to do with your plans in this world. But rather, let us continue to be a church who is willing to sacrifice everything, even a building on Buchanan Street, remortgaging our houses in order for your ministry. Help us to continue to be that church, to count the cost, and have a part to play in your great plan for this world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing as we close the words on the screens, a uh, familiar hymn, perhaps uh, a new tune to some of us, I think. Are you going to play the tune through?
Yeah. Uh, I think this is Matt's tune, is it, Matt? So if you don't like it, it's Matt to blame. <laughs> but it's a good one. So we're going to listen and then we'll sing. be not only words, but truth for all of us. And to that end, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>